Some have never heard the story of Jesus. That's what. Amen. Some people have never heard the story of Jesus. And it's our job. God's put us here on this earth, saved us, gave us of his spirit, gave us of his word. Our cup runneth over. And out of that overflow, let's share that with some people. Amen. Let's see if we can lead some people to righteousness. I watched a, a, a viral video yesterday and uh, it was uh, I was looking at my Twitter feed and uh, somebody had posted this video and it was it was a, a black business owner I don't know what city but he's standing out in front of us he had a pizza and chicken and fish kind of restaurant you know take out stuff and he's talking to he's he's got a place in there where you can register to vote and he starts talking to this man in the neighborhood, another black man, and said, who are you going to vote for? And the guy said, well, I'm going to vote for Biden. Why? Well, he's for black people. And then he asked him, he's been, he's been in politics 47 years. What has he done for black people? And he had nothing to say. Absolutely nothing. And in about 10 minutes time, he told why he was going to vote for Trump. And changed this guy's opinion in 10 minutes. Told him the story. Now, if somebody can do that, then there are still people in this country who need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. They need to hear that gospel. They need to know the story of why we believe what we believe, why we do what we do, why we stand for what we stand for. And we stand as a people in America for liberty. But liberty always comes with a price to pay. Always. And there are always going to be enemies of that liberty, whether it's political enemies in our country who want to do away with the Constitution or rewrite it or just blatantly go against it and put people in bondage. I don't remember which one it was, but I've got a book that was given to me by the author, Bill Federer. And he wrote a book called America's God and Country. And it was a, an encyclopedia of quotations of famous Americans and what they said and believed about God and our forefathers in this country, the framers of the Constitution believed that God had brought this nation together and given us the liberty. Even Benjamin Franklin, who was not a born again Christian, he was a deist. He believed in a supreme being but he believed that his hands were sort of off the earth. But one thing that Benjamin Franklin said, they were arguing about the Constitution, about how to write it and, and so on. And Benjamin Franklin stood up and he said this. And I'm paraphrasing, but he said, the Bible teaches us that not even a sparrow can fall without God knowing it. So how is it that we believe that we can form a nation without God's help? So he said, I recommend that each one of us go back home, get with our minister, pray and fast and ask for God's blessing and let's come back and see what God does. And they came back and they wrote the Constitution the way we have it now, including the Bill of Rights. Ben Franklin did that. One of those, one of those early forefathers, I cannot remember who it was, said something to this Sort of, sort of in this way. He said, if the chains of tyranny are ever put on and shackled the hands of the American, he will do it by voting for it. And this is exactly what we have going on in our nation. We have 
the media, the press, the liberal left, the Democrat Party that your grandfather was part of back in the days of Truman, back in the days of Roosevelt, and so on, is not the same Democrat Party that exists right now. They have been pushed to the extreme left and they want to take away our liberty. And they have proven that in states where they are run by Democrat governors who have clamped down even on churches against the Constitution of the United States. They've gone against that and clapped on chains of tyranny and people voted for that. And that's why people are leaving California. Let me read some scriptures to you. And I, I call this socialism slash communism. And socialism is the unhatched egg of communism. Once you have socialism in place, what was the name of the Russian nation during the days of communism? The Union of Soviet what? Socialist. Republic and those two words socialist and republic are contradictory to one another They don't fit they're not the same So and I want you to think of it in two ways number one how it affects this nation and our right To come to church to freely assemble Even with the danger of a virus going around How it affects us and our ability to preach the gospel to say what God said in his word, what, what would happen if socialism and communism took over in this country? Would we still have the right to say what God tells us to say in his word? There has never been a socialist communist state that allowed freedom of Bible Christianity. Never happened. James said this, James chapter 1, verse 25, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty. Now what's he talking about? Is he talking about the Old Testament? No. The Old Testament is shackles, bondage. Because God said, thou shalt not commit adultery, we committed adultery. God said, thou shalt not kill. James said, if you hate your brother, that's murder. God said, thou shalt not covet. Now, maybe you haven't killed anybody. Maybe you've not fooled around with somebody else's wife. But I guarantee you, you've coveted. And Paul said that it's the same as idolatry. Thou shalt not covet. So, we have a different law now that says two things. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Love thy neighbor as thyself. And on these two hang all of the law. That's what Jesus said. And if you look at the law, there are our responsibility to God. And if we love God, we will not break those commandments. And if we love our neighbor, we will not covet. We will not steal. We will not lie, bear false witness. We will not commit adultery with them. We, we will not kill them. We will not covet after them. If we love our neighbor then that's the perfect law of liberty. You don't do something to your neighbor, not out of fear, but out of love. And that's a different law. I love this country. Amen? Wayne loved this country. You didn't have to ask him if he was a patriot. He wore it proudly. He loved this country and he loved Jesus Christ and his word. Whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful here, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Now notice it says, continueth therein. Is there a danger? That the devil can talk people out of not believing God's word or going against God's word. I've seen it happen with my own eyes. Galatians chapter 5, turn there. 
Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Who wants to go back to the old days? Roy, do you want to go back to the bottle? God made you free. God made me free. God made all of you free. He took the shackles of the bondage of the law off of you and gave you liberty. So that instead of going to the synagogue on Saturday, you can worship God any day you want. Amen. Stand in that liberty. Don't let anybody take that away from you. If we lose the liberties that we have in this country, it will be done in the ballot box. People are voting because they want the government to give them something. John Kennedy was not a Democrat like the Democrats are now. He said, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. Amen. And what you can do is stand fast in the liberty. The governor's telling John MacArthur he can't have church. So you know what he did? Had church. Amen. Like I say, I don't like the man's doctrine. I don't like the man's Bible. I don't like anything about him. But I like the fact that when the governor told him he couldn't have church, he's having church. That's the liberty that Christ has given, that Christ died for. The liberty that those men on Omaha Beach died for. So that other people could be free from that tyranny. We're to stand fast in that. Now let me, let me give you a little rundown of the difference between socialism and communism. Versus the law of liberty. Socialism removes your individual identity. And let me tell you what I mean by that. Is it true that all black people smoke crack and are on welfare? No. So it would be wrong for me to look at a black man and say, or a black woman and say, they smoke crack and they're on welfare. It would be wrong for me to say that. Amen? Likewise, likewise, it is wrong for anybody to say, because I am white, I am automatically a racist. That is removing the individual, taking away his individuality and putting him in a class of people. He is equal or one with everybody else. And everybody else is exactly the same as he. So the idiot technology owner, company owner, who decided he was going to pay all of his employees the exact same amount of money, $85,000 a year, all of his research scientists left the company. Why? Because as an individual, they had worked, they had researched, they had got the diploma, they got the degrees, they did the work to be in the position that they were in. As an individual, they could do that. But this guy decided that everybody's going to be lumped into the same thing, and they're all, so the janitor now gets paid the exact same money as the guy who's doing the research for the tech company. And all the research scientists left. Imagine that. So it says, socialism says that you are identified by your class and how you think and how you are is shaped by the society, but not by you as an individual. Well, let me ask you this. Are some white people racist? Do some black people smoke crack? But it's not true of every one of them. Somebody say amen. Number two. In socialism, communism, all must serve the collective, which is the government. The people 
serve the government. Because in socialist nations, in communist nations, who is it that has the wealth? The Politburo, the politicians, the ruling class elite are the ones who have all the money. How is it, and I heard a guy say this, Dinesh D'Souza, I think, he said, how is it that Barack Obama could be in politics all of his life and his net worth be worth $300 million? How is it that that happened? Being a politician, on a politician's salary, how is it that he's worth over $300 million? That is because the people serve the collective. In the law of liberty, the government serves the people. Somebody say amen. It is our government. We have the right to choose who we want to rule over us, execute the laws, make the laws, and make everybody Truly created equal in God's sight. Somebody say amen. In socialism, you have the stealing of wealth and property. And I'm going to show you scriptures on that in a little bit. The stealing of wealth and property. So Joe the plumber asked Barack Obama, why is it that you want to take all my money away? Barack Obama said to him, as plain as day, I think if we spread the wealth around, it's good for everybody. But the fact of it is, that wealth does not belong to Barack Obama. It belongs to the man who labored, who worked, who earned it. Belongs to him. God gives people the right to own things. What did God promise to Abraham? He would give them and his seed a land to live in. God gave him that right. The government takes it away. They, the, Samuel warned Israel what would happen when they got a king. And the king did exactly what Samuel said he was going to do. In the law of liberty, property ownership is protected. In socialism, only the ruling class benefit. In the law of liberty, an individual benefits based on performance, intellect, and self-application. When immigrants came to this country... They came here knowing that they were going to be given the liberty to work a job, start a business, perform some sort of function that would, that would bring them economic gain. Some of them made an average salary. Some of them became millionaires in this country. That would have never happened in the country where they came from. In socialism, communism, it is ruled by the whims of the elite. There is a ruling class who thinks that they are smarter than you, better than you, more qualified than you to think for you. And let me say this. In the computer world that we live in, we are drawing very near to a time when socialism and communism will be part of the technocracy. Let me tell you what that word means. Technology and technocracy means that there is going to be a ruling technology. Once Elon Musk perfects the brain connection to the wireless internet world you will have a perfect communist state because every man's thoughts will be controlled by the ruling class elite I mean think about it a guy who works his way through college and is a professor of 17th century French poetry. Now, who's ever read 17th century French poetry? Who cares? Who cares? So this professor gets paid, let's say, $120,000. And then there's a roofer who, because he worked honest and he worked straight with people and he built his reputation... He's got guys everywhere, putting roofs up everywhere. This guy's making $300,000 a year in this country. 
Now, the professor thinks that he should be making more money than the guy who owns the roofing company because he is an intellectual who is smarter than the guy who's the roofer and he believes that he has the right to rule over this man and tell him what to think. That's socialism. That's social media. Am I right on that? Does social media shape the way people think in this country? In the law of liberty, we're ruled by the law of liberty. God's spirit, Jesus Christ's spirit enters into us. And all of a sudden, we love God like Jesus loves God. And we love our neighbor the way Jesus loves them and died for them. We're ruled by that. Now, I saw this this morning. This is a conference that is going to take place at a church, October 20th, 2020, called No One is Saved Alone. Now, what does that mean? It is a communistic stand on salvation. It says that if Sister D is not saved then none of us can be saved. Because we're all in the collective. But the law of liberty says that even though D, I'm just picking on you, she may not be living right, but that doesn't affect Brother Joe back there. He's going to live right. He's going to follow God's rules and God is going to bless him with salvation. Are there people who have gone to church, who have fallen away, and they will never come back? Does that mean that all of us have to fall away? Because that's what that means. No one is saved alone. That is called communitarianism. Remember back in the days, Roy, of the hippies? The hippies thought that they could all live in a commune and share everything that they had, including their wives and husbands. So they all collected, some would go out and work, some would go out and, and sell things at a market and bring in the money and the money would be there and it would be shared equally by everybody. But here's what ended up having, happening. You had some who were going out working and some who were sitting around the campfire playing guitar, smoking marijuana and sleeping with their wives while they were gone. And the guys who went out and worked and brought in the money said, you know what, this is not fair. I'm going out working every day, bringing in money so these guys can sit and smoke marijuana and sleep with my wife. I think I'm going to do their job. I want to sit and play the guitar and smoke marijuana and sleep with everybody's wife and let somebody else go out and get it. And pretty soon it all fell apart. There's never been, never been a communist socialist state that worked. Never, it's never happened. And here you have Pope Francis calling together all of the religions of the world in an ecumenical conference saying that none of us can be saved alone. God has to save everybody. That's communitarianism. That's communism in religion. Turn to Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1. Solomon is writing this as if we were his sons. I love this. He's giving wisdom to us as children growing up. And he's telling us about the world around us. And he's warning us about things not to get involved in. Listen to what he said. Proverbs chapter 1 verse 10. My son... If sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Do not join with them. You be who God made you to be. Different. Different than the rest of the world. If sinners entice thee, consent thou not unto them. If they say, come with us, let us lay wait for blood. Think Antifa. They are murderers. They are 
rapists, they are thugs. Let us lurk privily for the innocent without cause. I think yesterday they reacted to um, business owners who are friendly to police, firefighters, military people. They give them discounts. So their businesses were targeted by Antifa. These people did nothing wrong but stood for liberty. Verse 12, let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as those that go down into the pit. In other words, we're going to capture everybody. Verse 13, we shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cat, look at this. Look at verse 14. Cast in thy lot among us and let us all have one purse. That is communism. Communism. Where everybody shares the wealth that was stolen from the people who had it. Is that happening? Are there people, are there politicians who get into politics simply because they know that they will get rich? My son, verse 15, walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path. For their feet run to evil and make haste to shed blood. Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird. And they lay wait for their own blood. They lurk privily for their own lives. So are the ways of everyone that is greedy of gain. Which taketh away the life of the owners thereof. Look at your Bible. God is condemning socialism and communism. He's condemning it. And he's telling us as his children, do not take part in that. Think about, think about your relationship with God. Think about salvation. Are there people out there who despise you and hate you because you believe in Jesus Christ? Is that, is that true? Be different from them. Stand up for what you believe in. Don't back down. They're evil. And they want to draw you away. I counseled with a family where their children were targeted by a group of lesbians and atheists. Targeted. And they've lost several of their children because they were targeted for what they believe in. Christian family. Turn to 1 Thessalonians 4. Does the Bible tell us that we have to work. 1 Thessalonians 4.11 And this is right before he tells us about the rapture. Right before it. 1 Thessalonians 4.11 And that you study to be quiet and to do your own business. Individual. You're not working for 400 people to take your wealth. You are working for you and your family. That is your responsibility. I didn't understand that God would not let me pastor a church until I was married and had children. And because God, that was part of the rules. I didn't understand that. I didn't know that part. God said that I was not allowed to pastor. And if, because if I couldn't raise a family right, then I cannot manage the house of God. My responsibility. Your responsibility. You are an individual. If I fail in my responsibility, that does not mean that you have to follow with me. Somebody say amen to that. 
that you do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that you may walk honestly toward them that are without, that you may have lack of nothing. There are situations right now where women are having to work because of deadbeat husbands. Deadbeat husbands. Where are the husbands in the white redneck communities? Gone. Where are the husbands in the black communities? Gone. It's equal in both. God said, work with your own hands, that you may lack nothing. Proverbs 6, verse 6. Go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways, and be wise, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer, and gathereth her food in the harvest. How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? How many times in the Bible do, do you see where they rose up early in the morning? Multiple times in the Bible. Get up out of bed and go to work. This is what God said. Do your own work with your own hands. You may be surprised at what you can offer this world. I mean, who, who got rich from inventing those fidget spinners. Somebody invented that, got rich off of it for a while. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you to will and to do of His good pleasure. Just because Mr. Smith here, I'm making this up, just because Mr. Smith here decided he don't want to serve God anymore, Mrs. Smith and her family said, we're going to go to the house of God. If we have to go without Him, we're going to go to the house of God. I know a man. I watched him as I grew up in this church. He was on the board. He was uh, one of the guys that took up the offering. He was just one of those men. He was, I don't know if he was a Sunday school teacher or not. He was never mind. But he was one of those men that I looked up to. And then all of a sudden, he stopped coming. But his wife and his children said, Well, we're going to go to the house of God. And I'll never forget. His daughter told this. One Sunday morning he got up. She noticed that he got up out of bed. He would usually sleep in on Sunday because he was drunk, hungover. And he went to the closet, got his suit out, laid it on the bed and stood there looking at it on a Sunday morning. God was dealing with him. And Roy, he stared at that thing for a while, picked it up, put it back in the closet and laid down in bed. His daughter saw that. Several months later, on a foggy night on Highway 110, his brains were bashed into the back seat. He was drunk. He turned away from God. I remember the years that his wife went through. Because she would tell me things. She was mad at God for a long time. She finally got over it. That man had a choice, did he not? He was an individual responsible to work out his own salvation. If Mr. Smith won't serve God, then God bless Mrs. Smith who says, me and my family, we're going to serve God. Matthew 25, turn there. I'm almost done. My goodness, it's not even 12 o'clock yet. I'm tired though. 
But this is on my heart. Matthew 25. Notice what Jesus does here. Matthew 25 is full of stories like this. In Matthew 25, the, the setup is, here's Christ on the throne, and he's separating sheep from goats. And he defines who the sheep are and who the goats are. And of the goats, he says this. Then shall, in verse 41, then shall you also say, then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was in hunger, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. Go to Venezuela right now. Go there right now. And go to the grocery stores. Even if you had money, you can't buy food. There is none there. The government is bankrupt in that country. They bankrupted the entire nation. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you took me not in. Naked and you clothed me not. Sick and in prison, you visited me not. Then shall they answer him saying, Lord, when, we, when saw we thee hungered or a thirst or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them saying, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as you did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not to me, and these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Jesus picked individuals based upon what they did and what they didn't do. And he judged them righteously. Revelation chapter 20, turn there. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great. Look at what he's saying here. Kings die. And they all stand in judgment by Jesus Christ. Poor people die. And they must all stand. So here we have in one big group those who were great and those who were nothing in this world together. And Jesus takes them one by one and says to them what he's going to say. Look at what he says. And he said in verse... Well, let's continue in verse 12. They stood before God and the books were open and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged uh, out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And just because somebody wants to be a dopehead or somebody wants to be an alcoholic or somebody wants to be an adulterer or whatever it is, that doesn't mean that all of us have to follow with that. Separate from them. I guarantee you, every thought, every deed that you ever done was written by an angel in a book. But Christ covered our transgressions in that book with His blood. Why? Because we chose to follow Jesus Christ. Against the world. Verse 13, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and the death, death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. God did not take all the black people... God did not take all the white people. God did not take all the Hispanic or the Asian people. He did not take all of them, put them in a collective and say, because you're Asian, you're all going to hell. Or because you're white, you're all racist, you're going to hell. Or because you're black, you're like this and you're going to hell. God does not do that. Surrounding the throne of Jesus in Revelation 7 is people from every nation. Every family, every tribe, every tongue. Why? They chose to stand in the liberty that Christ made them free in. 
Whosoever is not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Romans 2 tells us that there are two types of people in this world. Romans 2 verse 2, But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things and, dis- and doest the same. Thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render, look at this, this is God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. God's not a communist. Somebody say amen. He made my body and every part of my body different from another part of my body. In every place he did that. And he tells us in 1 Corinthians 12, I think it is, that God makes different parts of the body and we are that body of Christ. You may be different. You may see the world a little different. I've got pastor friends that I love, that I trust. I don't agree with everything they say. They don't agree with everything I say. We are different parts of the body God using us the way He wants to use us. Somebody say amen. Don't try... This church can't try to be like somebody else's church. Because we're not. We're too weird for that. Amen. Amen, Dave. We're way too weird for that. Amen. Verse 7, to the hint... To them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath. The two types of people. The people who work out their own salvation with fear and trembling. And those who don't give a hoot about Jesus Christ. Verse 10, but glory and honor and peace to every man that worketh good to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. God, look at this, verse 11. There is no respect of persons with God. Does God look at a white man and say he's a racist? Does God look at a black man and say he's smoking crack? Is that true? No. God does not care what class you live in, what income level you live in, what color you are, how poor or how rich you are, God doesn't care. He loves you the way you are. And what He wants to change, He'll change. Now, let's go to Matthew 25. I'm going to skip part of it. You read Matthew 25, there's so much wisdom there. And God, it's Matthew 25 is right after Matthew 24. Matthew 24 is all that stuff he's talking about the end times, right? Well, Matthew 25, he's telling you who's going to get to go and who's not. So look at Matthew 25, verse 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be like unto ten virgins. So we got ten, got ten women here, young, young maidens. And they've all been appointed... To marry the king. Do they all make it? No. They were likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise and five were foolish. Five of them did not read Proverbs chapter 1 and believe it. They fell in with the wicked. And so... Uh, they took no oil. They took, had their lamps, but they took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. What is a lamp? It's a picture of the Word of God. The Bible. When there's no oil in it, there's no light, it means it's closed and you don't believe it. You don't read it. You don't follow it. You don't trust it. So they have a semblance of religion, but no power in it. So they create a power on the stage with the drums and the guitars and the singers. And a friend of mine told me that at his church, 
He doesn't know the names of the people who are on the worship team. They were hired to go to that church, play their music, and as soon as they're done, they leave. That's the five foolish ones. They have a semblance of religion. So verse 5, while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Now look at verse 7. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. Communist. They are communist. That's why they changed the name of their church from First Baptist Church to something community church. Because they believe in a communitarianism doctrine. That it's not right that one is saved and the rest of them are not. They follow what we just read Pope Francis came up with. They all must be saved or none of them can be. While I was laying in the emergency room after I was electrocuted, the woman chaplain came in, said she was going to pray with me and asked me what had happened. I told her that I was under my house and I was, did not know it, but I was on a bed of electricity. The main line had ruptured. And I was on my hands and knees and I was, I had electricity flowing through me, didn't know it. And when my shoulder made contact with the iron beam of the house, it closed the circuit and was killing me. And I couldn't do anything, couldn't move, couldn't, I wasn't breathing. I knew it. And I said, Mike, you, you're dead. You're going to die today. You're fixing to go, you're fixing to go meet God. That's how it is. And I made peace with God. And near the end, I said, God, I don't want to leave my wife and children. And it let go just like that. I'm not kidding you. And that female, oh, what a great opportunity for community. What in the world are you talking about, lady? But that's what she believed. So the five foolish virgins... Went to the five wise and said, give us of your oil. That's socialism. But the wise answered saying, not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. Buy for yourselves. Individual. So they left and while they went out to buy, the bridegroom came and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage and the door was shut. And afterward came also the other virgin saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, you know, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. When's he going to come, people? We don't know. So you know what? Put the oil back in your lamp. And be ready. Don't be foolish. Work out your own salvation. Just because brother or sister turns away from God doesn't mean that the other brother or sister has to follow. They can keep standing on the Word of God. Don't follow the crowd. Now, I haven't mentioned the election, but I'm going to tell you something. There's one man that stands for liberty in this country. And there is one man who we know is ruled over by a communist nation. He's in bed with them in multiple ways. And he is a liberal, leftist, socialist. Bernie Sanders at least is honest about his ignorance. He declares himself to be a democratic socialist. Now let me tell you what that word means. It wants to steer you away from every communist nation where there was no democracy. 
There was no choice on who to vote for. You voted for one candidate, that was the one, or if you got to vote at all. That right was taken away in most cases, and the dictators took everything and stole it for themselves. And you have to decide who's going to be the socialist and bring socialism into this country and who's going to stand for liberty. That's what you have to decide. It's your choice. It is your choice. I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. But it's your choice. Make the right one. Amen? Let's stand. Undertake your responsibility. This world is going to treat you mean and evil. I'm saying this to all the young people, those that are here, those that are watching online. I want you to listen to the Word of God. Follow it. Turn away from those who would turn you away from the gospel. And from the liberty. And those of you young people. Who are contemplating. Being free from. Your mom and dad's. Ruling over you. So you can go out and do. Whatever you want to do. I guarantee you. You're about to be in bondage. And some of you already are. And you put the chains on yourself. Father, we come before you today. And we ask you, God, to help us to keep standing for the liberty. This liberty I love. This liberty I live for and I live in. And I know, Father... That this liberty has a price to it. Freedom isn't free. There's a cost. I thank you for Jesus Christ paying the cost for me. Loving me. Loving me. In the way I am. And making me free Father, help us to stand for our liberty. Help us to stand against those who would put chains of bondage on us. Help us to stand and follow you wherever you go. Knowing, Father, that this life was just a vapor given to us. And it will soon pass away. All of us are appointed to die. And Father, I would love to die serving you. So Father, bless your word today. Speak to hearts. Get the attention of our children and our young people. Wake them up with your word. Warn them not to follow the sinner's crowd, but to stay away from them and be an individual believer in Jesus Christ. And be saved. Father we ask for that blessing. Bless your word. Bless these people. We thank you in Jesus name. And all of God's people said. Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed. Thank you for coming. We will be here on Wednesday night. 7 o'clock. Pray for those who are still sick. Pray for Brother Sterling. God bless you all.